Welcome to our Five on Five. We're pleased to be joined by Dr. Brian Gross from Southern Oregon Cardiology. Dr. Gross, good to see you. How are you today? Nice to see you. Thank you. Very good. So it is, uh, of course, February is Heart Month. And first off, let's, tell, let's talk about interventional cardiology. That's your specialization. What exactly is that? Uh, an interventional cardiologist is a person who does all of cardiology, but also does uh, uh, the various therapies through a tiny little catheter, no bigger than a ballpoint pen refill. It goes up to the heart and will open up arteries, put stents in there. That's primarily what we do. But there's, there's other more less, or less common things that we can do through a catheter as well. Wow, fascinating. It's amazing how technology yeah. has changed everything. So there are three different kinds of heart attacks, correct? Well, there's probably only two significant kinds of heart attacks. There's a, one which is a, a very serious kind called a cardiac arrest where the heart just suddenly fibrillates and the person passes out. And unless they get an EMT to them quickly to get them cardioverted in time, uh, the brain will die in short order. Uh, the patient just collapses. The yeah. other type of heart attack, which is a bit more common, which has traditionally been the Reader's Digest version of a heart attack, is when one of those arteries that feeds the heart, and there are three of them about the size of a ballpoint pen uh, plunger, mm -hmm. um, blocks off. And within a matter of seconds, the heart in that region supplied by that blood vessel stops moving, and the EKG changes, and then chest discomfort, a pressure, a tightness, a disagreeable sensation may appear in most people, not everyone, but in most people, in the chest, arm, neck, or jaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, then time becomes uh, of the essence. Yeah, if, if anyone is at home uh, you know, experiencing symptoms like that, how important is it that they act immediately and what should they do? Well, the first thing they should do if a person has known heart disease, they should stop what they're doing and often just sit down and it'll go away. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, they should take uh, a nitroglycerin, and they may even take a second or a third, especially if they recognize this as their typical uh, uh, heart discomfort uh, mm -hmm. quality. Something they may be familiar with. That's right. Sure. And, and if that doesn't work, uh, they should probably take two aspirin, two baby aspirin, and uh, call 911. Mm. because the paramedics have the ability to make the diagnosis if this is a serious major blocked artery, and if it is, they will activate the team that will open that artery from the field so everybody's moving to the heart cath lab in the hospital at the same time rather than waiting for things to occur in sequential order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the fascinating things about, about the heart, and please correct me if I'm wrong, obviously you're the expert, but there are so many factors at play, you know, smoking, the food we eat, genetics. Sometimes we have no idea, you know, I think you mentioned before we started recording, a marathoner could have, could have a heart attack even if they're in the best of shape. Is there some preventative we should do, people who may otherwise be healthy? Should they be taking like a baby aspirin daily or what can they do? If they have known blocked arteries, there's a real advantage to probably taking a baby aspirin. It's, it's only a small benefit, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very cost-effective benefit. Sure. Uh, the majority of things that people can do, I mean, the thing that'll make the biggest impact is to not smoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the data is overwhelming that uh, almost a, a sizable percentage, 60, 70 percent of the people that I see have been smokers. Uh, and then it, it, it acutely uh, disrupts the integrity of the artery and makes it more vulnerable to forming a blockage. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, eating right, doing modest amounts of exercise, controlling your diabetes, controlling your blood pressure, all of those are important. They are all incrementally contributing to the, to the risk and uh, you should do what you can to minimize that risk because uh, once it happens, we have to work really fast to try and minimize it. And if we don't minimize it, you could be left with a very serious debility uh, or even death. Mm. All right. So as someone who's specialized in the heart for, for years, what, what are misconceptions do you see out there? Are, are, there, are there things out there that you see, on, whether it's on television or, or print or anything, that, sure. that you say that you know, yeah. simply is not? Well, I have a, a lot of patients that say, oh, I've had 100 heart attacks. And there are a lot of heart attack mimics or things that uh, the public may say, well, it's an, it's an attack of the heart. Sure. The majority of people that I see for a chest discomfort syndrome, I would put them in one of three categories. As a cardiologist, they have either heart, heartburn, or a broken heart. Hmm. They all have a disagreeable sensation in here, and many times they have two or all three of them. It's not unusual for me to see a person who has previous heart damage and, and continued blocked arteries. They also have heartburn, reflux mm -hmm. of acid, or gallbladder problems, which I would put in that heartburn category, hmm. or a broken heart. 
where they've got a lot of financial, psychosocial stresses in their life, and we all know what that can do and give you a, an uncomfortable, disagreeable sensation in the chest. So it becomes a, a bit of a challenge at times, and some people who have one or more of them to figure out exactly what they have. It's, it's a no-brainer for us when somebody walking up a flight of stairs and they're 60 years old and have a very positive family history and mm -hmm. hypertension, diabetes, and they get this heavy pressure gorilla on their chest up into their neck and jaw with sweating and nausea. Red flags. Uh, that, that one's a, that, that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And many people present like that, but a good half of them, it's a bit more challenging to ferret out what exactly is going on that's giving them those symptoms. Is it a funny rhythm, an irregular rhythm like atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. or skipped heartbeats, or is it the heartburn, or sometimes they'll have dizziness and they're wondering, is it my heart or is it the, is it the inner ear or is it the cerebellum which controls all sorts of balance issues. Wow. And then there's shortness of breath issues, which can sometimes be a manifestation of heart problems with leaky valves or tight valves or weak heart muscle, but also blood clots to the lung from the veins and the legs or shortness of breath from anxiety. So it is an awful lot of symptoms that people associate with the heart that aren't necessarily one of those two heart attacks, mm -hmm. the blood blocked artery or the sudden cardiac death, but they're symptoms that create a great deal of concern because nobody likes to feel a sensation that they attribute to their heart. Wow, very good. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Well, it's Thanks been wonderful. Time. Thank you. All right, stay with us. We'll be right back.